of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall, ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence that your calling and election, to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for these worshipers here tonight. I thank you for the praises that have been lifted up. And Lord, we thank you for the acknowledgement of your good hand upon us. Even in the times of trials, we acknowledge your presence with us that helps us through those difficulties and often helps them not be as bad they could be. We give you praise. We thank you for these praises. Lord, we thank you for your greatness. Amen. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the privilege of being part of your family. Lord, we pray you would help us to grow in you. And we pray that these, these uh, thoughts today, this evening, as we look in this text, and as we add these truths to what we heard this morning, that you would help us grow up in our faith in a way that would honor you. That you would be glorified, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You going to sing or no? Oh, you can't? Okay, let's do it. <laughs> I'm, I appreciate Brother Eddie. Uh, he is such a blessing, and um, he's always a blessing uh, to just step in and fill in. You know, and when we were doing praises, I was, I didn't get this said, but I was blessed today by um, Sarah Dyke. Um, we, the Markhams are under the weather, and, um, and you know, I was, I was able to call her, uh, you know, Rachel, she was doing children's church, and she was tied up. But I called Sarah, and she said, yeah, I can do that. And then she got the material, and she said, oh, I'm excited about that lesson. And uh, her spirit was just a wonderful blessing. That's a blessing. You know, here in this passage, uh, it talks to, it's talking to believers, just like our text this morning was talking to believers. You can see that in verse 1. It says, Simon Peter, a servant an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with, with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, this morning in Jude, we saw our faith called common. And that's not common as in just kind of simple and base. It's common as in it's available to everybody. It's the same for everybody. And I'm so thankful for that. They're here in this text, it calls it precious faith. And, you know, the difference is what it costs to get it to us. It costs the blood of Jesus Christ. That's precious. Amen. It, it was God's love. That's a precious thing. Amen. 
and uh, the, you know the the preciousness of the value of it and uh, that's the difference it's talking about it's like two it's it's like a coin there's two sides there's two uh, sides to the same coin and the coin here is talking about our faith and one side is common the same for everybody uh, available to everybody but the other side it's precious and the in the value of it what it costs to get it to us and I'm so thankful for that but notice the very first word that we read there in verse 3 it says according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue you know uh, we're talking about growing up in Christ last week we were talking about growing down roots and and uh, building up and getting on the right a firm foundation and uh, and this morning we talked about uh, growing in Christ and that's our theme uh, it says be rooted and built up in Christ in him and uh, those things go together. It's two different things, but they go together. And next week we're going to expand on that a little bit further in our text. Go back there to our text, uh, just to refresh our memory. Go back there to, to Colossians chapter 2. That's our theme text for the year, our ministry theme. And I want to just kind of rehearse that with you once again. Colossians chapter 2. In verse 6 and 7, it says there in Colossians 2, 6 and 7, it says, as ye, have, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. See here, this, this passage is talking about growing in Christ, building up in Him. And the first thing I want you to see, we're going to look at how that works, okay? The building blocks of, of uh, growth in Christ. You know, uh, in education, there's a building block of sequential understanding. You've got, before you can do uh, upper math, you've got to start with the value of numbers, right? And, and just in the little bitty guys, I don't know, do you do that in Head Start? The value of like one being one item and two being two items and things like that. Do y'all do that in Head Start? Okay. And so, you know, two, you say two, that means two items. There's a value to it. And they've got to learn the value of the number before they can start putting numbers together, right? It's a building. It's sequential. And you've got to, you've got to understand how numbers go together to get bigger and then it's, it, it makes sense that if they go together to get bigger, then you can take some away and they get smaller again. It, it, it's, it's sequential. And then you can, you can do multiplication. And that's like, it, it's, that's like addition uh, ramped up a bit, right? And, uh, and it all works together. But if you try to jump to division without learning the value of numbers, you're lost, right? And, and even English is the same way. You know, uh, kids in, in middle school and high school, it's like, man, I learned this stuff in, in grade school. That's right, you did. But what they're doing is they're taking the basic grammar of, of you know, nouns and verbs and adjectives and all, and they're just adding a little bit more every time they go back over it again and again and again. They're building on that information you've already gotten. There's building blocks. And in the Christian life, God has a sequential order of, of how he wants us to grow. And these building blocks are very, very critical. Because if we don't get these building blocks in order, we are not going to experience the kind of, of Christian experience that God wants us to have. Instead of having a firm foundation... We're going to have a shaky ride all the way. And I don't know if you've ever been on roller coasters that are really shaky. Like wooden ones with those metal wheels. Those make me nervous. Give me a metal one with those rubber, you know, those rubber wheels. Give me one of those because them are smooth. They can go up and down and around and corkscrew and, and you just feel safe. But those wooden ones... With those metal wheels, 
you think you're going to fall apart, right? See, there's a lot of Christians, they, don't, they haven't built their Christian life with these building blocks of understanding, and they're shaky all the time. And then they look at somebody else, and, and they, they just, they, they look like they've got it together, and they look like they've got confidence, and they look like, you know, they're trusting God no matter what, and they, they look at all of that and say, how do they do that? They, they probably built on their faith the way God said to. And that's one of the reasons why we really encourage baby Christians to get in discipleship. And uh, you want to you wanna get excited about your walk with the Lord, get around some baby Christians and disciple them. That's exciting. But here we see the how. The first thing we see is the how of growing up in Christ. And notice the word there, according as his divine power hath given unto us. That term there, according as, is very similar to what we see in Colossians chapter 2 in our theme where it says, as ye have therefore received. The same way you received Christ, grow in Him. The same way you received Christ, be rooted in Him. And we talked about that months ago at the beginning of the year. We receive Christ by faith. We need to grow in Christ by faith. We receive Christ through the truth of His Word. We need to grow in Him through the truth of His Word. We receive Christ by listening to His Spirit convict us of our sins and convince us that He is the way, the truth, and the life. And then compel us to trust in Him as our Savior. We are going to be rooted in Christ the same way by listening to the Holy Spirit speak to our hearts from the Word of God and then obeying what He says. You would have never gotten saved if you did not obey the Holy Spirit convicting your heart, right? You're never going to grow spiritually if you do not obey when the Holy Spirit speaks to you from His Word. You are stifling your Christian growth when you, do, when you do not obey the Holy Spirit. See, here in this passage it says, according as His divine power hath given unto us. That is the how. He's given us what we need. And this this term here has to, it's a comparative adverb and it's speaking of the manner. It says, according as his divine power, by that divine power, that is how you're going to grow through the power of God in you, through the power of God in his word, through the power of God through his spirit. He wants you to grow in him in the same manner that you trusted him, grow in him. And he's given you everything you need already. See, what, what is it that he's already given us? What is the manner of how he wants us to grow? It's by God's power. It says, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. My friend, you're saved by the power of God. Guess what? You're going to grow by the power of God. You're not going to do it in yourself. You're going to grow in His power. You're going to grow in His divine power. It says divine power. That's God's power. That's not your power. And it's God's, it's the same power that saved you. It's the same power that keeps you. We looked at that this morning in 1 Peter. We're kept by the power of God. Until the Lord returns, we're kept by the power of God. It's that same power. It's that divine power of God that will enable us it enabled us to be his child. It will also enable us to live the way he wants us to live. Amen. And it's also the same power that's going to help us bring him the glory he deserves. It's according to that power. We cannot grow on our own. We need to let that power help us grow. According as his divine power hath given us. Notice the verb tense there, hath given us. That means we already have it. When did you get the power of God? When you got the Holy Spirit of God. Right. According to Ephesians 2, He quickened you. He energized you with life when you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. My friend, that's when you had access to the power of God. When you got the Holy Spirit of God living in you. When you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. What you need to do is yield to that power. What you need to do is listen to that power. We already have the power in us. What we have to do is benefit from that power. And notice also, not only, it's, not only is it by God's power, 
It is by God's provision. Notice it says, hath given unto us. He, he's given it to us. His power has given it to us. He's provided it to us. See, this power, this provision comes from God. And it comes with God. When you receive God into your life, that power comes with it. That provision comes with it. Everything you need to live the way God wants us to live in his power. And notice it says, for life and godliness. Life on this earth lived a godly way. Everything we need, we got when we trusted Christ. Amen. We got God living in us. We got his holiness in us. We got... His Holy, Holy Spirit to help us understand His Word. We became part of His family. Everything we need to live the way He wants us to live as His child, we already have. We just have to benefit from it. We have to access it. We have to let it work in us. See, it comes from God. It comes with God. This provision comes with God. And if you have God in your life, you have the power you need already. You don't need more power. You need to experience the power you have. It's like when we talk about being filled with the Spirit. It's not about you getting more of the Spirit. It's about you giving yourself more to the Spirit. That, see, we've got the power we need by the person of the Lord in our lives. See, God's children already have everything we need to live to God's glory. We have his grace. We have his righteousness. We have his instructions in his word. We've got his Holy Spirit. And we've got the support of his family in, in the church family, the body of Christ. And we've got the support of a shepherd trying to guide us and direct us and encourage us and feed us and watch over us. We've got everything we need. We just have to benefit from it. Just like salvation. When Jesus died on the cross and rose again, you have everything you need to be saved. Amen? You just have to benefit from it. Amen. See, Jesus' death in, on the cross and his burial and resurrection pays the debt of sin. His word, his gospel, communicates that truth. Amen. His Spirit is the one that wants to, is, is convicting us and drawing us. No man comes to the Father unless he be drawn. And it's the Spirit that draws us. But you and I have to obey that, don't we? Same thing's true in growing in the Lord. Everything that's needed, we have access to. We just have to benefit from it. We have God's presence. It says, notice it says there, at the end of verse 3, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. See, it's in, the, it's in knowing God, knowing him personally, knowing him experientially, knowing the truth about him from his word. See, it's about God's presence in our lives and experiencing his work in us. I mentioned in verse 1, it talks about that precious faith. And it says, through the righteousness of God. In verse 3, it talks about through the knowledge of God. And then in verse 2, it says, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. My friend, we've got, if we want to experience his presence more, we have got to know him more. We've got to know his truth more. That's why I say over and over and over, we will never be all that God wants us to be without regular corporate worship and regular personal worship in our lives. Amen. See, we've got to know him to experience him and experience the, what he wants for our lives. See, we need to live in the presence of God. We need to live in the godliness of God. We need to live in knowing God. These, these verses, these first three verses speak of knowing God, knowing His righteousness, experiencing Him in our lives. We need to live in the glory of God. We need to live in the virtue of God. We're called unto His glory and His virtue in verse 3. We need to live by, the faith, by faith in God. We, we have this faith. We need to grow in this faith. We need to live through the grace of God. Verse 2 speaks of His grace and also His peace of trusting Him. You know, when we trust God more, we experience His peace more. Guess what helps us to trust God more? Knowing Him more. 
In these first three verses, it says knowing his righteousness, knowing him, and verse three, knowing him, uh, knowing him again. We got to know him. The more we know him, the more we can trust him. And then also, it's by God's promises. His power, his provision, his presence, and his promises. Look, if you would, please, there in verse 4. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of a divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. My friend, this book right here, I've heard people say this. This book will keep you from sin, and sin will keep you from this book. Amen? My friend, we need to know his promises. And we need to know the promise giver so we can, we can grow in him the way he wants us to grow. This is the how of growing in Christ. It's through his power, it's through his provision, it's through his presence, it's through his promises. See, God's word is, is the greatest book on earth. There's no other book like it. God's word is a priceless treasure that we need to hold precious to us. God's word helps us to know God more so his holiness can be lived out in our lives more. God's word gives us maturity and strength to resist Satan and his temptation and help us to live in and through the power that we already have in our lives. God's word helps us to avoid the destruction of sin and enjoy the blessings of God. My friend, we need to be in his word. So that's the how of growing up in Christ. Those are all, those all build on one another. And they all are about our relationship with the Lord. Every one of those has to do with our relationship with the Lord. That's our foundation, amen? amen. But I want you to see something else. Not, only the, not just the how of how it works. How, how do these building blocks get fit together? That's how right there. But I want you to notice the what of growing up in Christ. The next three verses speak of these different elements that need to be built into our lives in a sequential order to help us grow up in Christ the way he wants us to. My friend, I want you to understand God's plan for your Christian experience goes far beyond just being saved. That's just where it starts. And the sad reality is, so many Christians, they think, oh, I got saved, I'm done now. <laughs> no, you got saved, you're just darting, <laughs> amen? You're just, getting on, you're just getting on the roll, amen? See, God does not want us just to be saved from the consequence of our sin. God does not just want us to be delivered from hell and bless us with heaven. God does not just want us to be born into his family for eternity. God does not just want us to know him just enough. You know, there's way too many Christians, they know God just enough. Just enough to be saved. Guess what? That's not how much God wants you to know him. He wants you to know him intimately and personally and up close. He wants you to know him well, not just enough. See, God does not just want us to have his newness in our oldness. You know, in Matthew chapter 9, it's not in your notes, but in Matthew chapter 9, in verse 16 and the verses around there, it talks about no man takes new cloth and puts it into an old garment because it'll, it'll make the tear worse. What you've got to do is you've got to take that new cloth and make it a little old and then put it in the old garment and that way it'll fit right in fine. And then it talks about putting uh, new wine in old cloth. It'll burst. You know what we do? We put the newness of the Lord in our oldness and we hang on to our oldness. And then we wonder why it doesn't work. God doesn't just want to change you on the inside. He wants to change all of you. Amen. Amen. See, He wants so much more for us. I tell young preachers, and, and I'm, if, I'm not trying to say this to knock anyone. I'm, it's just reality. And it's everywhere. It is everywhere. One of the frustrating things as a pastor, you see in people so much potential. 
But it takes them wanting that for them, for them to experience it. And way too many of God's people settle for far less in their walk with the Lord than they could experience. And as a shepherd, you, you just see what they could have, and you see what they settle for, and you're like, oh man, it could be so much better for you. Here in this passage, we see that God does not just want us to pray memorized prayers of repetition. He wants us to pray from our heart. He wants it to be deeper for us. God does not just want us to be satisfied with the surface level truth of his word. He wants us to dig in and study. God does not just want us to experience the basic blessings of God. You realize there's some blessings of God that that Christians settle for that everybody gets. God wants you to experience so much more of his blessing. Not just the basic blessings, but the rich blessings of being intimate with him. God does not want us to be content with observational worship. He wants us to get involved. Amen. He doesn't want you just to be blessed by being here. He wants you to be blessed by experiencing him work in your life. Amen. See, my friend, God has so much for us beyond what too many of us settle for. And God's plan requires diligence on our part to experience what he wants for us. Notice, if you would, please, there in verse 5, it says, And beside this, give all diligence, add to your faith. See, he wants, to, he wants us to add to the foundation. He wants us to build up. I don't think we showed you the video, but if you've ever watched a video of a, of a foundation for a uh, uh, windmill, you ought to watch that. It's a big hole. There's a lot of concrete at the bottom of that big windmill. You know why there's a lot of concrete down there? So that windmill stays up. <laughs> Amen. See, God wants us to build up. You know what? It would be sad if you had this big hole for this foundation and, and it stayed a big hole. The foundation is just the getting started part. He wants you to build up on that, right? See, God says, give all diligence, add to your faith. See, we must give our, our diligence to this for it to happen in our lives. What is the diligence we need to give? Showing up. I mentioned that this morning, making yourself available. We got to show up for worship. We got to show up for Bible study. We got to not just show up, we actually need to get involved in worship and studying God's word, not just showing up. We need to get in we need to we need to do the part uh, diligent about resisting the devil so he will flee from us. Doesn't the Bible say that? That's our diligence. If we resist him, he will flee from us. But that's our diligence. And then we need to do the diligence of our part in serving the Lord with the gifts He's given us and making ourselves sensitive to His Spirit and instead of our carnality. See, that's the part we need to do, make ourselves available. We must give all of our diligence to this, not just segmented. It says, notice it says, give all diligence, right? Not just a little bit of diligence, all diligence. My friend, our spiritual growth is, needs to be important to us. Amen. It needs to be a priority to us. We need to give all diligence to it. See, this, this needs to be a higher priority than other things. This needs to be the first thing we take care of, not the last thing we take care of. This must be what we are passionate about above other things. If we're going to give our diligence to it, it's got to be a priority to us. I want you to see also God's plan involves addition resulting in multiplication. I mentioned to you before the building box of education. Second grade, right, Rachel? Next year too, right? Yes. So you start with addition, not multiplication, right? Because Michael, or Kenneth's in it right now. And You've got to get the addition part down before you get the multiplication part down. They're basically the same thing. 
It's just, this is a lot simpler than that, right? But, and, but multiplication works a lot faster, right? See, God wants us to add so we can multiply. If we add these things to our faith, we will multiply our effectiveness for the Lord. We will multiply our experience with the Lord. And we will multiply our impact on the world. But if we try to do it another way, we will struggle. And we will, we will have doubts. We need to do it his way. Notice it says, the first thing he wants us to add to our faith, virtue. You want to know what the second thing is? Knowledge. Any class, anybody want to tell me why virtue comes before knowledge? Because knowledge of loan does what? Puffs up, that's right. See, virtue comes first. Virtue speaks of the holiness of God. Virtue speaks of the, the righteousness of God. Virtue speaks of the moral character that God wants for his children that looks like him. And it's, it's so opposite of our human nature. Virtue. See, God wants us to have knowledge, but he wants us to have virtue first. He says, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, so we can avoid pride because pride, our knowledge, puffeth up when it's alone. And then it says, he says, add temperance to our knowledge and to our virtue. You know what the word temperance means? A lot of people mistranslate this. Temperance is not the same as patience. And it's not the same as self-control. A lot of people use those interchangeably. Temperance, self-control, they're not the same. If you looked up the Greek word, it's not the same. I know a lot of Bibles translate it that way. I'm telling you right now, it's not the same thing. Temperance is something different than self-control. You know what temperance really is? Holy Spirit control. It's about being yielded to the Spirit. You know, when you temper a piece of metal, what do you do? You heat it up to make it what? Stronger. That's what this word is. Temperance is about yielding to the Spirit so He makes us stronger. So He takes our personality, He makes it better. He makes it what God wants it to be. It's about yielding to the Spirit and letting Him work through us. And then, notice it says in this passage, it says temperance and then patience. They're not the same thing. It's not redundant. It's two separate things. See, when we add patience into the mix, it'll help us to multiply our impact for God's glory. You know, one of the worst, one of the hardest things for, or, or one of the most detrimental things for a Christian testimony? A lack of patience. When we just fly off the handle, when we are abrupt, when we do not show grace, that, that, is, that hinders our testimony. And so many Christians, especially when we're young, we don't, we don't add these things to our faith. So we go into our Christian life and we want to move on. We want to move on. God says, add these things. Grow in these building blocks so you can be all that I want you to be. So you don't struggle with doubt. So you don't struggle so much. See, he wants us to add patience into the mix. But he also wants us to add godliness into the mix. So that all of this helps us to look more like God. Isn't that the way a, a child is, right? A child is supposed to have some of the resemblances of his forefathers, correct? You know, uh, when Michael was born, Grandma Erickson called him Chip. Because he was Chip off the old block. <laughs> I'm the old block, right? Because <laughs> there's a lot of family resemblances. My brother takes after my mom's side of the family and his complexion and his appearance and, and different things like that. I take more after my dad's side of the family. But there's a family resemblance, right? 
Sometimes I make a hand gesture and I'm like, oh man, that's my dad. Oh. But, you know, if we're in God's family, there ought to be a family resemblance, right? Amen. See, he wants to add godliness so we look more like him than we do like we used to look. And then adding kindness into the ingredients because that helps us to have the impact God wants us to have. God's grace helps us to be nicer. Amen. And then he says, add to all of this charity. And notice it uses the word charity because that's God's kind of love. That's 1 Corinthians 13. See, God wants us to add these things. These are the building blocks that he wants to add. This is the what of how he wants to build our Christian life to help us have the impact that he wants us to have. But I want you to see also the why. Why is this so important? Pastor, why are you even preaching this? What, what's the big deal? I mean, aren't we just supposed to learn and grow, right? No, there's a process of how God wants you to grow. And the process is just as important as the, as the goal. The goal is growth, amen? But the process of growth is equally as important. And that's what the rest of the passage is about. I want you to see the benefits of obedience. Look at verse 8, if you would, please. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, class, what makes us not barren? Ourselves? No. These things, correct? What are these things? Those building blocks, the what that we just went over, and the how that we went over before, the power of God, the provision of God, and the, the promises of God, the presence of God, these things, if they be in you, they will help you to be fruitful. Every child of God wants to be fruitful. God wants every one of his children to be fruitful. He wants us to bring him glory. He wants us to use our gifts. He wants us to be a witness. He wants us to be productive while we're here. Way too many of God's people are not doing that. Why? Because they're not growing the way God wants them to grow. And they're being barren and unfruitful because they're not growing the way God wants them to grow. Look at verse 10, if you would, please. Wherefore, rather, brethren, give all diligence. There's that word again. Or excuse me, give diligence this time. In verse 3 is give all diligence. Give diligence to making your calling and election sure. Class, who's the one making our, our, relation, our, our calling and election sure? We are. Give diligence. You give diligence so you have confidence. When, I, when people come to me and say, Pastor, I'm doubting my salvation, I do not try to talk them into being saved. I want to find out why they're doubting it. One of the, re one of the most common reasons a Christian who's been saved for a while doubts their salvation is they know they're not growing and they know they should be growing. And therefore, they are doubting their relationship. Because they know there's got to be more than what they've got. So they're thinking they don't got it. And maybe they don't. But maybe they do. And they're just not benefiting it from the way God wants them to. See, the Bible says here, if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you are fruitful. They make you sure in your relationship with the Lord. They help you. It says, for if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. They help you to be faithful to the Lord. And my friend, don't we all want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant? These things will help you do that. Help you be faithful. In verse 11, for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord Jesus, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. See, abounding in more growth, it, it helps us to mature in our faith. Spiritual fruitfulness 
in growing, in knowing God more. It, it helps us to have confidence in our relationship with the Lord. Abounding in that confidence in our faith and in our relationship with the Lord. Because we, we see Him working in us. We see, we see that we're growing. We see that we're making progress. We see that, that we're yielding to Him. We, we see what we see in here. We see in here. And we see it working. And it gives us confidence. Yes, I'm a child of God. You know what? When I get spanked by God, I'm reminded I'm a child of God. Amen? Amen. Oh, but when I see God working in me in a positive way, I'm reminded I'm a child of God too, right? These things grow in us, helping us grow, and they help us to have confidence in our relationship. See, immaturity in our faith is one of the leading causes of our doubts. One of the leading causes of God's children living in sinfulness and being deceived by Satan and false teachers is spiritual immaturity. See, God wants us to grow so we're not so susceptible to deception. I talked about that this morning. See, He wants us to abound in growing and fruitfulness. And He wants us to abound in His blessings. Not only here on earth, but also in eternity. He wants us to abound. I want you to see the consequences of disobedience, though. Look at verse 9. But he that lacketh these things is blind, cannot see afar off. And hath forgotten, notice this phrase right here, hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. This is very key. We're talking about Christians here. But we're talking about Christians that are not growing in the Lord, so they're getting drawn back in the world. When we struggle with sin, and we don't see victory, and we don't see progress, not that we're perfect, because none of us are perfect. But when we see ourselves struggling and struggling and, and not getting any progress and not getting any traction, we've got to ask ourselves, why is this happening? And not growing as God wants us to grow is one of the reasons that happens. By not adding these things, we hinder ourselves in our spiritual sight. By not adding these things, we hinder our spiritual ver vision of seeing what is possible. The idea of, of being blind means you don't see the present. But not being able to see afar off means you can't even see what's possible. My friend, God wants us to see presently that we are his child and he is working in our lives and he's helping us with his word and he's convicting us of sin and he's motivating us in righteousness. We can see that right now. And then he wants us to have a vision of what he desires for our future. I want you to get there. I don't want you to stay here. But my friend, when we don't add these things into our lives, we stifle our own progress. And then we struggle. And God's giving us a warning right here. Yes, you will struggle if you do not grow the way I want you to grow. And then notice also the assistance for obedience. In verse 12 it says, Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. Peter is saying, I'm here to remind you of what you already know. And there's people here that are sitting here. Maybe some of this might be new to you, but there's people here that you say, yeah, I've heard that before. Guess what? I'm here to remind you again. Amen. Just like Peter says, and as long as I'm here, I'm going to keep reminding you because I don't want you to forget because these things are important. And these things will help you. See, Peter is being a diligent shepherd in reminding these people because one day he's going to be gone. He doesn't want them to forget. He's prodding them. Notice verse 13. He says that I stir you up putting in remembrance. Notice remembrance in verse 12. Remembrance in verse 13. Remembrance in verse 15. I kind of think he wants his people to remember, right? Guess what I'm here to do? Help you remember. Amen? What? In that, the first couple of months of school, what do you do? Review. That's right. Why do you do that? To remember. So you can add more, right? That's what I'm here to do. To remind you of what it says so you can make more progress. You don't have to stay where you are. There is something more you can experience with the Lord. 
He's prodding them. Sometimes a shepherd prods. He pokes a little bit. Amen? Sometimes this book pokes a little bit. Amen? Sometimes the Spirit of God pokes a little bit. Amen? See, he's being a faithful shepherd. He's being a preparing shepherd. He's preparing them by feeding them God's word so they can grow in maturity. He's preparing them to be equipped to do God's will and live, live beyond just Peter. And guess what? I want you, I want to I help equip you on Sunday so you can live Monday through Saturday uh, more of what God wants for you. That's my job. Beyond me as you walk with the Lord through the week. Amen. And that's what Peter's trying to do. He's trying to equip them so they can go beyond just him. Preparing them to be ready to meet the chief shepherd. You know, you don't give an account to me, you give an account to the Lord. But I'm here to help get you ready for that. He's trying to help prepare them for a good accountability on judgment day. He's just trying to be a help to them. And that's what a shepherd is. A shepherd is a helper. Uh, sometimes I jokingly say that when I hold the door. I'm a professional helper. That's basically what I am. I'm just a professional helper. <laughs> I'm here to help. That's all I'm here to do. You know, at, at uh, the nursing homes, this is why we need helpers at the nursing homes. Can you imagine how long it takes for one guy to go around and turn the pages for 13 people? It takes a while. Some, some of those people, they... they They either can't find the number or they can't actually physically turn the page. We have one lady. She's there almost every Monday at La Grande Post-Acute. She cannot move her arms. She can't even open her hands. Her hands are, are constantly like this right here. She can't move any of her faculties. How in the world is she going to turn a page of a songbook without help? That's what I'm there to do, to help her. That's what I'm here to do, to help you. That's what Peter says he's doing here, helping them. You know, the interesting thing about help, you've got to want to be helped before you can really be helped. When somebody tries to help you and you don't want help, is that help? That's kind of aggravating, isn't it? <laughs> right? Right? See, for us to be helped by the Lord, we got to want help. For us to be helped by the Word, we got to want help. For us to be helped by a shepherd, you got to want help. I hope this has been helpful. Because that's exactly what God wants it to be, helpful. Let's pray.